Thank you all for having me. It's my pleasure to be here for the first time ever. Purple is my favorite color, so this university just blends with me easily and I feel at peace. Uh, but I'm here not to give a public lecture, but just to have a conversation and share a bit of my experience and an experience we've all faced because we're going to talk about human rights in terms of a public health crisis and the recent public health crisis that we've all faced is around the issue of COVID. And so we just want to speak as people who value human rights, as people who value rule of the law, what have we learned from COVID? What have we learned from previous pandemics such as HIV or SARS? And are we actually seeing any meaningful input for human rights or are we just paying lip service to it? So I hope to speak to a number of issues uh, especially what has been most difficult in public health crisis. Do you promote the individual's right or do you promote the general's population right? And we saw it with wear a mask, don't wear a mask, get vaccinated, don't get vaccinated. Where do you draw that line and where do you draw the balance when government talks about they want to protect the public interest, whereas there are people who feel by doing so, you're stepping into their personal space in certain cases where a national law gives you that right or an international law where your government has been able to do so. So that's what we're going to talk about and see where do we strike the balance? What have we learned from COVID? And going forward, what can we do as academicians, as activists, as human beings to try and ensure should COVID version 2 come back, we are better prepared in how we handle it. So I will touch on three broad areas. The first one is just that interplay between public health and human rights and to use some examples of things that happened during COVID-19 and some of the things that have happened for us in Kenya around infectious diseases and how governments have gone about dealing with them in the name of uh, addressing public health and human rights. And uh, I'll go to my comfort zone, which is litigation, and share one or two cases in Kenya and South Africa that showed what role do the courts play in terms of uh, taking rights forward. And then lastly, coming back to the precious pandemic accord that we seem not to be negotiating and finishing and then I'll definitely be ready to have a conversation with you. So let me start off by just saying that uh, the experience I've had and the experience we've seen, be it the HIV response, be it the COVID response, be it the TB response, is that many governments take a medical approach towards addressing pandemics. It's always about what is the science? How do we treat this? How do we take this forward? But as they do that, they forget about the people who are actually affected by the particular issue that they're working on. So they rarely consult. And as you can see in the case of COVID, the experience we had was that our governments told us what to do. No one asked us what we were thinking. No one asked whether we have food at home while they tell us to stay at home. No one found out if we had ways of getting access to masks, but it was a top-down approach. And the sad part about COVID is that there were other pandemics before that taught us only taking a biomedical approach and only taking an approach that is top-down would not be successful. But that is the trap we found ourselves during COVID. And so the challenge then becomes, what is it that is stopping us from learning from the past lessons. We know when you involve affected communities in decision making, there's better uptake in terms of public health responses. But where you turn to law enforcement to enforce public health measures, it becomes a disaster. We saw documentation from the UNAIDS that showed people were killed for not wearing masks in certain countries. We saw policemen using excessive force to enforce public health measures, which then ended up being a counter-effective measure because if you're gonna arrest people for being out during post-lockdown or curfew hours and then hold them in a prison or in an isolation cell with other people, 
it did not make sense at all. And I draw this back from the experience in Kenya where we had a public health act. Unfortunately, the only thing we share in common with the UK is that they colonized us. And currently, the other thing we share in common is that the king is currently visiting Kenya. And I gladly made the escape to avoid the traffic uh, that is occasioned by the visit. But we have been operating with a public health act that is a result of borrowing a lot from the British laws that were there back in the days. And the experience we drew from the Public Health Act in Kenya draws me back to a case we worked on in Kenya about three gentlemen who were persons who were infected with TB and they failed to attend clinic once and they were marked as people, as they normally call them, lost to follow up. And we have a law that says that if someone has an infectious disease that puts others at a risk of getting infected, then the public health officer can make an application to the nearest court uh, to have those people to be held in isolation. The law does not say where that person should be held in isolation, but in this case, these three gentlemen were then arrested and the public health officer saw an affidavit before a court saying that uh, because they had disrupted their treatment, they were a risk to their families and the risk to the public. And the public health officer sought to say that the most ideal place to hold them in isolation was a prison cell. Now, the nature of most prison cells in many countries that we come from is one that you have congestion, you have many people, and for tuberculosis to thrive, it needs you to be many in a room with poor ventilation. And that is exactly where they took these three gentlemen to try and ensure that while they're in prison, they could be monitored to adhere to their treatment. And that is an example of what we then saw again in COVID. People were getting arrested, police officers turned into public health officers, and we question ourselves then if the governments are keen to safeguard the public space and the public good, why then use punitive measures? And so that becomes a growing concern that we want to look at and see where do we find that balance in terms of, yes, rights can be limited, but again, to what extent? And then coming to the limitation of rights, the pandemic in certain areas, people declared a public health emergencies. In other areas, parliament stopped working and the executive started making their own laws without consulting the public. And so the question then becomes, what is then the rule of law in that particular situation? And when we turn towards the international instruments, we couldn't find a particular document that would guide us all around when there's a pandemic, this is how you share vaccines, this is how you share technology, this is how you share information. And that posed a challenge in terms of what does cooperation look like? What does solidarity look like? And in the absence of a proper guiding document that would be binding to many nations, we found a lot of inequality came into play. Inequality came into play in terms of access to vaccines. We know many countries that had the ability to stockpile uh, only began sharing vaccines when there was a threat of them having to expire. And again, we saw issues where diagnostics were not easily available and there was of course great resistance in terms of the willingness to respect existing human rights treaties like the TRIPS that allows for transfer of technologies, that allows for sharing of technology, that allows for various ways to ensure that you can make this happen. And this pushback was informed by the fact that because of the inequality between the countries that had resources and the countries that didn't have resources, there was an uneven negotiating power. And for that reason, you could never be able, apart from naming and shaming, there was no legal mechanism to say country X is hoarding and this is going to be a danger. But the goodness of COVID, it made us realize it didn't matter how much you stocked vaccines and vaccinated your people, 
because we are a global village, people had to move from one area to another. And so the movement of people who are vaccinated to areas where we had people who are less vaccinated led to the creation of different variations of the COVID uh, virus. And that then meant further that you had to go get booster shots, you had to go get other things to happen. And the, what was driving the movement was the ability to trade and get back to a normal business. And so that being realized as a challenge led to the fact that then those who were stockpiling and holding the vaccine saw the need of wanting to share, of wanting to take forward because it served their interest. And then coming to this, we then had the whole conversation, is it time to have a treaty that looks at how we deal with pandemics. And indeed, there was great interest. A number of us wrote articles around if WHO, which is not very common in terms of welcoming to other players other than member states, is going to drive a treaty process, how do you ensure that there is meaningful representation? How do you ensure that there is public participation? But most importantly, how do you ensure that the pandemic accord is centered around human rights? And so the early days of COVID saw a lot of interest in terms of the pandemic accord coming into place. It showed a lot of solidarity among the lower middle income countries coming together as a negotiating block. South Africa, India, Rwanda, and many other countries came together to say, look, we are here, we have the ability, we have the capacity to be able to manufacture some of these vaccines, we just need an ability to bring the technological parts together and began their negotiations. But as soon as we began getting back to normal, the willingness to transfer technology, the willingness to share information has then gone back to the status quo where the countries that have the money, the technology and the ability are then taking hardline positions on the pandemic accord and saying we should not open up a conversation around transfer of technology, which then begs the question, do we have to be in another crisis to realize unless we share things, we are all going to be affected? And so that then comes back to my initial conversation of what will it take for us to learn? What will be the push? that makes it possible for us to realize for all humanity to thrive, there needs to be a need to address the different inequalities that come into play. And so the question that we need to ask ourselves as legal scholars, as human rights activists, as academics, what are we going to be able to do to address the power play that exists in this world in terms of the inequalities of those who have and those who don't have, but are willing to do something because that is where the tension continues to exist. And I don't remain very hopeful about the pandemic accord in light of how the drafts continue to water down even things we've already agreed upon a long time ago. And now people are even trying to drive us further away from the things we've agreed upon in terms of human rights, and that presents a problem. And so we need to then understand and figure out as scholars, what can we do to continue emphasizing the need of having human rights principles to guide any treaties that we come up with, any laws that we come up with. I've not even mentioned the myriad of laws countries adopted, the regulations countries adopted, that were not even in line with their own constitutions, that were going very different from what they've already agreed upon as, as part of regional and international instruments. So as scholars, the question that begs is, how do we ensure that human rights continue to be underlying principles? Just to end on the issue of international instruments, a conversation then arose about the famous Siracusa principles, the principles that talk to us around what steps do you take when you want to limit rights? Of course, the Siracusa principles were developed not in the context of a health pandemic, but were developed in the context of dealing with civil and political rights. And of course, they have got provisions around public health measures. 
And we saw a great drive by academic institutions. Uh, of course, with a push from civil society seeking involvement to start looking at were these principles actually fit for purpose at the moment? And what could be done to be able to drive a new set of principles that can be able to underlie dealing with pandemics and taking pandemics forward? So again, the COVID crisis or the public health crisis that we have has then provided an opportunity around, can we shape and relook at the existing principles that we have? And I know there's a process that has been led by a number of scholars, including yours truly, Sharifa, and others around trying to think through what do this look like? So there are questions around laws and processes that we need to interrogate, but the key question for us is, how do we ensure that human rights principles underpinning some of the rules, the regulations that come through. When we come to the role of the judiciary, I'll start with at least the good news, which is I think on the 17th of August this year, the South African court, based on a lawsuit that had been filed by a civil society organization called Health Justice Initiative, seeking to compel the South African government to make public the agreements they had signed with pharmaceutical companies around the COVID vaccine, the purchases they had made, was successful. And the court did compel the South African government to make that information public. And indeed, as a way of promoting transparency and accountability, when the documents were made public between the agreements the South African government had signed with this particular pharmaceutical company in terms of access to COVID vaccines, it was revealed that the government had paid more than what others were paying during the time of COVID, which then allayed the fears that many had that the absence of holding private sector accountable the ability of private sector to have direct negotiations with government without any oversight, without any scrutiny exposed, at least for the case of the South African government. We are yet to see more lawsuits elsewhere. So you can imagine if this happened to South Africa that had lots of negotiating powers, what then happens to other countries that did not have that ability? Were they paying more than they're supposed to pay? And how did we allow this inequality to thrive? How would we allow countries that were not able to even afford to be made to be paid higher than countries that could be able to afford? And so again, it goes back to the ability of as much as everyone thought Health Justice Initiative was crazy to file that suit, that has opened a whole conversation around how do you hold the private sector accountable and especially in a pandemic process when they have the technology or the resources to develop a life-saving intervention how well do we ensure that they're being able to be held accountable? In terms of the Kenyan courts, we still have ongoing legal battles. I know many who are affected during COVID as international students, you are sent home. And when you are sent home, your countries welcomed you into quarantine because they didn't want you to, for lack of a better word, bring COVID into the country. But in the case of Kenya, and in many other countries, I would say, there wasn't much thought process around what would the quarantine process look like. And so many people were thrown into public institutions, children, women, without taking into account do they have underlying issues, are they getting the right information. So we filed a number of lawsuits, uh, particularly dealing with women who had come with children uh, during the time of COVID, and they were just put into quarantine without information without taking due care of the special circumstances that children need. Uh, some were put in hygienic places. And we've had decisions by the court saying that indeed, even though there was a pandemic, the government remained obligated to be able to respect human rights. And there are also cases of people who got detained in health facilities during the COVID pandemic period because they were unable to pay for their medical bills. And that, of course, is forced detention in one way or another. But this was also coming at a time when a number of global partners had said they would support governments to be able to foot the bills and to be able to take care of some of the medical expenses that come up. So human rights violations continued to happen during the pandemic. Uh, 
But fortunately, in certain countries, including Kenya, South Africa, Uganda, and others, the court still remained active in terms of providing guidance and in terms of being able to provide uh, provisions that would be able to guide the government in terms of ensuring the rule of law remained to be upheld during times of uh, pandemics. And so it's important for us to then think through as scholars what then becomes our role in terms of ensuring A, how are we driving forward human rights principles? How are we pushing for the rule of law? And how is some of our research and information being able to guide these processes? Because the processes are wide, you may not be able to address all of them, but there are areas of expertise you all have. Some of you are strong on rights to information, some of you are strong on intellectual property rights, some of you are strong on matters dealing with migrants or migration. And so the question then becomes, how well are you collaborating with others to be able to ensure that we are getting the change and you're getting the framework that we want to have? In a world where human rights is becoming, for lack of a better word, a luxury, something that seems to be a bother to certain governments, to certain people, we live in a world where someone would buy a social media company and decide he doesn't need the human rights advisors anymore and they can do what they want to do. How do we survive in that world for those of us who care about rights? How do we keep vigilant? Because at the stage we are in, in this world currently, we are currently on the defensive because the attack on human rights, whether it's through wars between countries, whether it's through social media companies that are perpetuating hate speech, whether it's through different governments who are coming into power and want to push back on the freedoms that people have had. It then means as people who really care about human rights, whether we are students, whether we are professors, whether we are lawyers litigating, we have a role to play and we must not give up now. This is when we need to put most of our efforts in terms of safeguarding what we already have, but also still trying to push the needle further to ensure that we are more in a safer space, especially in a time when things are changing in terms of digital technologies taking more space, but the uptake of digital technologies is coming up also with a lot of human rights risks and human rights exposures, especially for vulnerable populations. So we need to think through about that perspective and think through what role are we trying to play? We need to ask, are we in the right spaces? Anyone working on driving the pandemic accord? Are we collaborating with the right people? I'm hoping to see many lawsuits and many amicus briefs coming from this excellent university to many of our courts, not only in Africa, but also elsewhere, because there is expertise and information you have that can be able to guide some of this conversation. So I see a lot of opportunity for collaboration, both from global north, global south, south to south conversation around how do we use our expertise? How do we use our experiences? How do we share the resources that we have to safeguard the human rights that are under threat? Because what the COVID pandemic has revealed is that in times of crisis, human rights will be thought of as the last option. And yet, it needs to be the starting point to inform our decisions and how we move forward. But our governments have clearly demonstrated that this is not something that would give a priority if they were given the option in terms of dealing with any public health measure and threat that comes out. So as I conclude my conversation, I want us to remember that it's not a fight between the individual and the public health space. It's a question of balancing. And for you to be able to balance the individual interest and the public interest, it requires the provision of information and it requires using a method which we call the rights-based approach in terms of empowering people, giving them information, helping them decide, and only limiting human rights as a matter of last resort when you're guided by the different laws and policies within your country. It's also important to ensure that 
we have to ensure that we continue to use the legal processes that are available to us in times of pandemics to be able to advance the rights that we have, whether it's access to medicines by fighting intellectual property barriers, whether it's access to information to ensure people have the right information about the vaccines they are getting, what is it about the vaccines, whether it's about the right to privacy for not having an app that tracks where I go, what I do, what my temperature is, or sent alerts to someone as to where I am. We then need to be able to ensure how do we continue to safeguard those rights because those rights will continue to be threatened. And then thirdly, we have to then think through the issue of collaborations. Collaborations is the only way that we can go. And as I spoke to other colleagues earlier today, I see a lot of potential between academia, civil society, and the people who are actually affected by the issues coming together in a meaningful manner. It may not be only on health, it could be on climate change, it could be on environmental issues, it could be on access to information, it could be on digital technology, but I think we definitely have to try to forge forward in terms of ensuring that those who are affected by the issues we are working on are part of the people we speak to, are part of the people we consult, are part of the people we engage in our conversations. They may not have PhD, they may not have masters, but they definitely have lived experience that would be very important in terms of helping us shape the direction we think, shape the writing that we do, but also shape the advocacy that we do. But as I said earlier to the colleagues you're speaking to in our health and human rights workshop today, getting your recommendations and your thoughts and your publications to become a reality on the ground to change people's life should be what fulfills you as an academic, should be what fulfills you as a human rights scholar, should be what fulfills you in terms of making this world a better place because when they are able to drive it long after your publication, long after the case has been litigated, and that has been our experience, that as much as some of us as lawyers focus on getting the judgment, we have now learned that without the community, you could have the best written judgment, articulating all the international instruments and the latest writings, but if you don't have the community voice behind you, pushing the governments, pushing the UN agencies, pushing the private sector, you're unlikely to see the change that comes. So my clarion call is that I'm hoping that this conversation will get this excellent university to start thinking through and building up and making more investments around the way you teach, the people you bring into the classes to speak to the students, the kind of materials that you bring for the students to have exposure, the people you collaborate with. You provide a lot of exchange abilities and uh, for placements for people uh, within organizations to come and get the experience. I think those are things you need to continue making increased investments because that exposure, that partnership will be the journey we start towards ensuring that we are not only safeguarding human rights, but we are expanding the horizon to ensure that those we care about, who are you and me, because we are all affected by climate change, we are all affected by digital technology. It's no longer that thing for people living with HIV or people with TB. We are all now affected and now we start need to thinking through how do we work from a solidarity point, a collaborative point, and a point that ensures that we are driving human rights forward. So I want to end by saying that we are all agents of change in here, and it's not just for the activists or the academics or the affected people. We all have to get our sleeves rolled up and ensure that we are in this battle together. I'll stop there before I bore you any further. Thank you for listening. I'd like to know if you have any thoughts, questions, and as I've learned in the academic world, disagreements and difference.
scholars are happy to take a couple of conversations and then we can continue our drinks. Hi, my name is Aisla, I'm from Warwick Law School. So uh, when you were, you were talking about uh, public interests, yeah, and private interests, I had, you know, there was a thought in my head that, uh, for example, in some countries, uh, when there was pandemic time, uh, for example, in Ukraine, they said that if you are not vaccinated, you can't uh, come to work and do your job. Uh, and there, even in uh, high education institution, there, in, uh, there was a restriction. If there's eight, uh, not eight percent of staff is vaccinated, then this institution couldn't work. So my question is, what do you think? Can government have this right to make this kind of restrictions? And where is this line between public interest of like like, like safety, right? And private interest and your private right to decide that I want to be vaccinated or I don't want to be vaccinated. Thank you a lot. The issue of the right to fair labor practices vis-a-vis uh, -vis the issue of vaccination, that's actually an issue that was litigated in Kenya before the Employment Court, where actually the government uh, issued a directive saying that we had a working from home uh, guideline for government officials, uh, but when vaccine, vaccines were made available in the country, our government officials were asked to be able to take the vaccine and get back to work so that they could be able to drive services. But we had certain government employees who had underlying conditions, and as you rightfully say, there was not much information at that time in terms of what are the effects of the vaccine if you had an underlying condition, and some people were Resistance. So a number of government employees who are older and had underlying conditions filed a suit before the employment court saying that uh, by compelling them to get vaccinated, whereas as an option to work from home or they would take other mitigation measures such as wearing masks or finding to work in an isolated place within the workplace uh, was affecting their right to fair and labor practices. Now, unfortunately, the employment court did not agree with them because again, the reasoning of the judge was that uh, there was no evidence at that time that said that the vaccines would be affecting people with underlying conditions and that this was in the interest of the public, that you have to be vaccinated to avoid uh, putting other people at a risk. The case has been appealed, uh, so it's still at the court of appeal. Unfortunately, many years later after COVID is still going on. But the key question there for me, and I remember we supported one of the people to be an amicus on that case, was even as the court wanted to limit the rights of certain people, what was the balancing act they are going to take? Because there is no clear answer to say, fine, get vaccinated or you don't go to work or stay and work at home. You have to find and you have to interrogate what is that balance? What is the middle ground that you can be able to reach and understand? What is the reason for this person not wanting to get vaccinated? Are they genuine? Have they been taken into account? But also, what safeguards, if possible, can be put within the workplace that would allow the person to be able to come into work and to be able to deliver, while also trying to understand what is the nature of that person's work? Do they interact with other people? Are they dealing with paperwork? What's that kind of interaction? And so unfortunately, many courts have not been able to strike that balance. And it goes back to the point of saying, it's not a question of individual or public winning. It's a question of striking that balance. And it's gonna be an extremely delicate balance, especially in situations where you have a disease whose cure is not known, whose control is not known, and that was what we are facing during COVID. I just want to draw back, and I know this is not comparing oranges and oranges, but if you draw back to the question of the three gentlemen I talked about who had tuberculosis, it did not make sense to isolate them in a prison cell. But in the mind of the public health officer, they wanted to take a punitive approach so that it could send a message to anyone else who dared not to take TB medicine to know you can go to jail. And so again, you'd have expected a reasonable court would have looked at the balance and seen that sentencing these people to go to prison doesn't make sense. And that's why we are looking at the fact that 
we want when we have certain situations those who are invested on human rights as many of you are coming out to be able to drive this discourse because there's no right or wrong well there's no black and white answer it's a question of balancing and even when you balance if you go to the extreme of anti-vaxxers uh, you may never satisfy everyone but you must be able to show that you made that balance and it was very reasonable to be able to do so so again it depends on the circumstances that arose within your country around where do you be able to strike that balance but i know there are a number of at least in kenya we have seen a number of lawsuits about that particular issue and for me it goes back to how do you get that balancing act and that's where the principles that guide limitation of rights and in looking at the Syracuse principles as a number of scholars have done to be able to update it and see where you strike the balance is one way uh, to be able to go. Uh, hello, I have two questions to ask. And the first one is um, during the COVID-19, uh, we have two conventions. The first one is DTAP and the second one is COVAX. But all these two things that not that useful because the CPAP is especially ignored by the medical companies and the COVAX, the vaccine is not that, uh, don't have a very good quality. So from the perspective of human rights uh, law, uh, what can we do to better um, solve this problem? And the second one is, um, it's very common for the countries to say, although we have produced many vaccines and uh, but we need to serve our citizens first and then we will send this vaccine to other countries in help and uh, maybe sometimes the vaccine sell into the other countries will cost a pandemic price so do you think it is a uh, uh, it is kind of vaccine uh, notionalism that's my question thank you okay I think the challenge that came with COVAX was one mistake they first make is that they never involved other players. It was a question of certain UN agencies or certain multilateral groups uh, together with the funders or some of the rich countries deciding around how they would set up this particular facility. And so even though COVAX was set up to be able to ensure that we wanted them to be the body that is helping ensure vaccines when developed are being distributed equally to different countries it ended up advan being advantageous to the countries who had more money and it did not eventually work out and in fact there is a publication by COVAX themselves of an audit that was done to them around what were their weaknesses and their strengths and they admit around the inability to ensure that all players are on the table to have fair negotiations and have clear direction around how our vaccines distributed was the criteria was one of their weaknesses. So gladly, it's one of the few agencies that has actually done a proper public audit of what went well, what went right, and they're hopefully going to have to be able to take it uh, forward. So I think the issue of na vaccines nationalism, but still goes back to the question I talked about, which I don't have an answer for, and many of us still don't have, the inequality that exists between countries the inequalities that exist even among individuals because even in access to vaccines in our own countries those who had the ability to get to where it was it easily got to them or it got to the vaccine but those who are poor and vulnerable were the last ones to be reached whereas from a human rights principle you should be starting with the most vulnerable and the poor in terms of getting interventions to them so that begs the question around how do we drive the thinking of governments? How do we drive the thinking of decision makers in different bodies to be able to ensure that they are putting priority to those who are at need first and not those who have the ability to pay? Unfortunately, it's not an easy battle to win, but it's definitely a battle worth having. Thanks very much. I, I just wanted to, to ask your thoughts on the issue that you raised about access to information, which clearly is a, a super important issue. So you're probably aware, uh, certainly in this country and many other countries, that with something like a pandemic where the knowledge wasn't necessarily there amongst the 
the expert fields as well, so the, the bodies that were advising governments. And, um, and that creates, I think, quite uh, significant issues in terms of the information that you were, you were saying that people should have access to that information. But what is the information if actually the advice at the time might not have been correct? So for example, here we've got currently the, the you know, um, discussions about that. And, and um, uh, there were sort of counter groups set up where other scientists were involved providing, I suppose, better information, but you need to have the knowledge about that in the first place. So there was a real issue, I think, in many countries about you know, what is the correct information and then finding out it was inaccurate. And then alongside that, I think the, the problem that we face currently in terms of the use of social media where misinformation is disseminated. And I, I think this makes this issue really quite problematic. And I just wondered what your thoughts were about that in terms of moving forward. Thank you. I think COVID was a difficult time. And I remember when WHO, who were guiding us, decided to give us an all size that fits. We were told to stay home, we were told to wash hands, we were told to maintain social distance, but in certain contexts, the nature of our house structures does not allow for social distancing because we are next to each other in informal settlements. Uh, you ask people to wash hands, but people don't even have water to drink, so how will they prioritize washing hands? Or you ask people to stay at home while they depend on wages uh, where you go to work for a day. And so it did not work. And so, again, it goes back to the issue of in a case where we are not clear of the right intervention or the right messaging, it is always good to contextualize interventions to the need of the different communities that we are working with. And that was one of the failures of WHO at the earlier stages of trying to come up with a blanket guidance for everyone in terms of what need to do without A, ensuring and knowing what was their situation and what are they able to do and not able to do. Eventually they backtracked and started making interventions to suit the local circumstances. So that's one part of it. The second part of it that was very difficult to regulate and still continue to be difficult was the aspect of misinformation. Now the aspect of misinformation brings us into this conversation of digital technologies, uh, social media platforms, and how then are those platforms regulated? We all know what has happened with X or Twitter, depending on what they call it now, and the fact that it's almost impossible to regulate them in terms of they don't have people who guide on their ethical standards, they don't have people who guide on their human rights standards because whoever is the owner right now does not see that as a priority. But the question then begs, what do we have within our national laws? What do we have within our governance systems that can be able to hold some of these corporates accountable? And then the question then becomes for us, especially where the corporates are registered. So if they're based in the UK, if they're based in the US, if they're based in Rwanda, are there laws that exist that would allow me as a Kenyan citizen to hold them accountable because of the harm that they're bringing within my country? And so again, the issue of misinformation comes to the ability to hold the platform that is allowing for the misinformation, the actual person that's driving the misinformation, what are the platforms and rules available to hold them accountable. And then the last part for me, which WHO did to an extent, was the ability to come back and say, this was what we gave as guidance earlier, but we've now realized after a number of months or days, this doesn't work. For instance, uh, they talked about fumigating and getting people to fumigate places, and they realized that didn't work, and at least they came back and backtracked. And so the question then becomes for a credible agency, be it the Ministry of Health, be it the UN, be it WHO, be it the African Union, do you have enough leadership to come back and say, look, we guided you this way, but we realize this is not the way science has changed and this is the way that we are going. And we've seen this happen even in the HIV world. We've seen times when certain guidelines or certain practices have been driven and propagated by various agencies, but later on they discover that has not worked and they come and course correct. So for, 
my thought is around how then do you cost correct where you have sent out information at the time that you wouldn't know that it was not the right thing to do or the best thing to do, but the moment you discover there's a cost correction mechanism, you quickly alert the people that need to know about it, just like the way the car manufacturers do it when they discover they have developed a model of car and the brakes are not working and they recall everything back. How can we have similar efforts when we're dealing with pandemics and issues? Um, thanks, Alan, for, for, for the conversation and being on this conversation. So much has been said about the misuse of criminal law in response to health emergencies, to pandemics and epidemics. And there's a lot that has been published around how it creates deterrence and it's counter-effective, as you said, to use your words. But I wonder whether you have some thoughts around a proper role that criminal law and punitive measures could play in the broader scheme of uh, pandemic or uh, epidemic responses, if at all. Uh, because I think it's one thing to, to keep telling countries that criminal law doesn't work, but you know, people say, yeah, if, if you're, if you're if the person who works with a hammer sees everything as a nail, and <laughs> criminal law has become that hammer um, uh, that's used to pr practically address the unknown, especially when we are like, uh, there's moral panic and, and limited information. So what what are your thoughts on the role that criminal law can play and how do we message better or differently so that uh, there isn't the misuse and there's a proper use, uh, if at all? So, uh, Ken, I'm not a fan of criminal law, but I have to be very objective in my answer uh, because I've seen and the clients I've represented have faced a lot at the hands of criminal law, but generally no one likes criminal law, especially when you have to pay fines or run the risk of going to jail. But I think the approach and the guidance, at least I have learned from the HIV movement, is that there's been a lot of use of criminal law in the HIV response, particularly on the aspect of exposure or what people normally call deliberate infection. In fact, just two days ago, or three days ago, we have been alerted of a case in Kenya. I know this is digressing, but I need to give the example to just be able to demonstrate when does criminal law become an issue of last resort. But we have an example of a house help who has been arraigned in court in Kenya for a criminal charge called deliberately infecting or putting a person at a risk of getting HIV because she spat on her employer's food. I don't know why. But the employer, again, digital technologies, came back home to review the CCTV camera at the end of the day, and that's how they found out that the person had spat on the food. And so when she was arrested, they did a search in her room, and they found ARVs in her part of her medicine. And so the charge they have preferred against her is a charge under the Sexual Offenses Act, which we have challenged before the Court of Appeal, uh, saying that she has deliberately infected or put someone at a risk of getting HIV. Now, in, for those of us who understand the HIV world, it's a good thing that she's on ARVs because when you're on ARVs, your viral load is likely to be so low that your chances of transmitting is negligible. And to be more realistic, your chances of transmitting HIV via saliva spat on food is almost zero. So for the law enforcement to think the best charge to put forward for this house help is deliberate infection, talks to the fact that we need to think backwards in terms of how well are we making investments for those who actually prosecute and for those who actually charge to be able to understand what is the effect of this criminal law and what objective does it seek to achieve? Because from my experience, I, we can't keep up with the cases in terms of going to file, challenge the unconstitutionality. I think the other approach we're beginning to take is, why not sit down and have a conversation with the prosecutors? Why not sit down and have a conversation with the police and say, look, this is the science of this thing. This is what happens. If you're gonna take a criminal approach, consider it as a last resort, but these are the effects it's likely to have. 
So that's one avenue to be able to look at and say, how well are we working with the judiciaries? How well are we working with offices of prosecutors? How well are we working with uh, offices of ombudsmen and other people who have the responsibility to ensure that uh, they understand if they are going to then apply the criminal law, the certain guidance that's put into place and so ICJ, with a number, the International Commission of Jurists and a number of other scholars, have published certain principles that can guide judiciaries and law enforcement when dealing with criminal law to still have a human rights lens. I know it sounds far-fetched, but to have a human rights lens when they're applying criminal law, they encourage you to look up the principles, but that's one way to approach and say, human rights law can still be applied in the context of criminal law. And so the principles the ICJ has developed is one way to be able to go about it. But in terms of public health, my appeal from the evidence and the practice I've seen is that let the criminal law be the last resort that someone turns to, especially when there's clear demonstration that there's a risk or a very actual threat that's going to happen. And you then need to restrict the movement of a person or to be able to take things forward. So conversation over drinks, but yes, last resort, invest more in informing people, giving people information and understanding what is holding them back from wanting to comply. Are there things that are stopping them and what can be done to remove those barriers and measures before you rush towards finding them, prosecuting them or putting them in jail? Uh, you made a really good point concerning about um, how the government fails to usually act in times of health crisis and they kind of forget those who are already infected. They kind of focus more so on prevention. Do you, re do you reckon that it should be kind of an update to the human rights where there might be like, um, there should be a right to protect the sick or s some sort of idea like that? I think this is part of what is being discussed partly as the pandemic occurred, but also another measure the, I don't want to say the governments, but another measure that has been thought is that they have created a fund called the Pandemic Fund. And this Pandemic Fund exists to prepare countries. Uh, it's hosted by the World Bank and a number of countries, including the US, have put in quite an amount of money to say, how do you prepare countries to be ready for pandemics before they hit? And that's where the question you raise comes up to in terms of when you're looking at pandemic preparedness, what are some of the principles, what are some of the priorities, what are some of the ground rules we have to set in terms of prioritizing those who are vulnerable, prioritizing those where science or evidence that's correct at that point of time is able to show that give these particular people some form of priority in terms of the interventions that they need. And so that's why I say, though not very hopeful about it, the pandemic accord remains one of the treaties that I think we still need to push. Why I'm not hopeful is because the negotiations at WHO mostly or only involve member states. So unless your government is very pro-human rights and we're having very few of those governments in existence. You have very few people in the room who are driving a conversation of wanting to see a pandemic treaty that will be able to ensure that it's centered on human rights and is driving conversation forward. We are more reclined to dealing with side statements, side meetings and being able to take issues forward. I don't want to stand between you and drinks, but I'm available for more conversations and to be able to take this forward. Thank you very much for staying in and thank you very much for your attention. I've enjoyed the conversation.